The Banco or Volga Gambit is a defense for black against the opening which begins with the first move d to d4. It is good for those interested in a compact opening system with a standard opening setup and pawn structure. It is used at the highest level and is definitely one of those solid sound options that is also not too extensive and difficult to learn. In this video, I will focus only on the basic Banco structure, which means that we will not deal with the uh, side variations or go into the theoretical lines. It is going to serve as an intro to the Banco Gambit middle game and end game strategies with the typical ideas and plans mainly from the Black's perspective. Now, in order to get into the Banco, we need to make the following moves. E4, Knight F6, C4, c5 e5 and b5 when i saw this with the white pieces some 30 years ago for the first time i remember checking my opponent's reaction expecting him to actually realize that he had just blundered the b pawn after a few minutes of thinking i just took that pawn thinking that my opponent is certainly not a strong player and this will be an easy ride to another win black immediately responded with the a6 Suddenly I had the feeling of falling into some kind of a trap, but I couldn't see what kind of trap it was because my opponent was moving his queenside pawns, which were not even close to my king. However, I realized that their bishop on c8 is intending to move to the square a6 as soon as I capture this newly offered pawn. I thought to myself that this was no big deal. I had a plan. That plan was to take that pawn and after g6, knight c3, and bishop takes a6 to play e4. The plan is to castle by hand. Bishop takes f1, king takes f1, d6, knight f3, bishop g7, g3, castles, king g2, and knight bd7. Actually, I felt happy when I got into this position, not knowing that it was all theory and that although I'm up a pawn, it is far from any kind of advantage for white. Interestingly, like everyone else at the beginning of their chess career, I thought that being up a pawn, I should simply exchange pieces and simplify into a winning endgame. After I finally lost that endgame, I was furious and told my opponent that he was lost the whole game because he was down a pawn with no compensation. You can imagine how ashamed I felt after checking the game with my coach right after the tournament. The truth is, the endgames in the Banco Gambit are not that good for white, even being up a pawn. That's a chance for black when playing against someone who is not so familiar with the opening. Now remember how the main line looks like, because we'll be using this pawn structure a lot in the future. Understanding this pawn structure is the key to knowing what to do as black when we want to use this weapon against our opponents. Now let's start. This is the bank of pawn structure. Note the fact that two files on the queen side are half open. The black rooks can occupy them and exert pressure. Structurally, there are no obstacles for black pieces on the queen side, which means that the better chances for black overall are on this side of the board, while white will probably play through the center or on the king side. After adding a pair of rooks on each side, this is a position we may get. From the start, black is down a pawn, but according to the engine, has an edge, minus 0.2. It's not much, but if white is not careful, they can easily go down. For example, rook a3, king g2, rook a8, and now in case of a wrong move like h4, instead of rook fb1 and pushing b4 in order to trade the b3 pawn for the c5 one and equalize, Rook takes a2, rook takes a2, and then rook fb1 with idea of b4, but it's too late because rook a5 and then b4 doesn't work because of rook b5. And if white plays king f3, we just secure everything with rook b5, and black is better for a whole point according to the engine, thanks to the b3 weakness in white's camp. Here we have another rook endgame, but with a bit different pawn structure on the queen side. This time we are targeting the b2 pawn. So let's say rook b3, rook f e1 and after rook a b8 rook e2 let's say and then just we take the pawn on a3 and after b takes a rook b1 king g2 rook a1 and black is clearly better thanks to the a pawn weakness moving on adding the dark square bishops one on each side black's pieces are simply so powerful that white can't be complaining if they lose only one pawn even though it is their turn 
possible outcome may be let's say a4 bishop takes bishop takes rook takes b2 and here black has an obvious advantage thanks to as in the previous case the a pawn weakness moving on after adding a pair of knights on f6 and c3 the white knight is standing on an excellent place because one defending the b2 pawn from the g7 bishop and two supporting the a2 pawn in case black creates greater pressure now black wants that piece removed and at the same time to move away their own f6 knight so the g7 bishop can exert pressure and becomes more dangerous there are a couple of ideas of how it may look like here we can see a maneuver of the f6 knight going to the b5 square via e8 c7 ending up on b5 and in this case if white refuses to trade the b5 knight enters the d4 outpost which is even a greater success for black possible outcome is the following line knight takes b5 rook takes b5 a3 rook b3 rook a2 and rook a2 b8 after this we can easily regain the pawn on b2 although there are possibly even stronger options for black overall black is better another idea for black is to move the knight from f6 to d7 b6 and finally to the a4 square adding pressure not only against the c3 knight but also on the b2 pawn and once the knights get traded the black a8 rook ends up on a4 preparing to double on the a file with an attack on the e4 pawn this is how it may look like in practice and according to the stockfish black is better for almost two pawns even though being down a pawn at the moment that's how cunning the bank of gambit can be finally black's f6 knight may end up on the e5 square not instantly opening the diagonal for the g7 bishop but regrouping to another strong post in the white's camp either d3 or c4 from any of these two squares there will be definitely more pressure against the b2 pawn and the g7 bishop becomes open and is hitting the c3 knight let's say white plays rook d1 so knight c4 and believe it or not black already has a winning position feel free to analyze it further in order to discover what kind of options black has here in order to cause a serious headache by the way the move rook b1 doesn't really work because of simply bishop takes knight on c3 thanks to the pin on the b file it may look a bit confusing but this is a position after adding the final pair of knights on d7 for black and f3 for white again the f6 knight repositions itself to a better spot and we can see that it goes again to the e5 after which it gets exchanged for the one on f3 then the d7 knight enters e5 and from there it either goes to d3 or c4 which is the situation we saw in the previous diagram now another way to go with the d7 knight is to reposition it to the b6 square from which it goes either to a4 or c4 square a plan that we already saw discussing possibilities for the other knight of black in this case however black is already winning by playing either knight a4 or knight c4 we will go with a line that computer doesn't really like that much but still provides a serious advantage minus 1.2 knight a4 knight takes a4 rook takes a4 and now hitting the e4 pawn while preparing to double on the a or b file according to stockfish black is clearly better the next situation is something that can happen if the light square bishops are still alive as we can see the light squares in the central part of the white's camp especially the d3 are weak and black may work on bringing one of their knights to that d3 square mainly using the g4 again and e5 squares for example knight g4 rook d1 let's say knight g5 knight takes knight takes let's say f4 here not the best move for white but knight d3 finally and now you can see the whole power of this knight threatening to take the pawn on b2 but also threatening to remove the defender of that b2 pawn which is the bishop on c1 case white is stubborn trying to defend the b2 pawn playing rook d2 black is completely winning the least we can do is trade on c1 and after rook takes on c1 then use the bishop check the white's king and put it on e3 after winning the exchange in case the queens are still on the board we can see that black queen is a bit clumsy and not that much useful in the bank although admitting that she can 
add more pressure along the open files. However, trading them is usually in Black's favor and we should not hesitate in case there is a chance to get into some sort of endgame. Meanwhile, already known plans are on. So we are going with the knight g4 in case of h3, knight e5, knight x, knight x, and then we are threatening to come to d3, so let's say rook d1, but then just knight c4. Let's not forget about c4 square, it's also valuable. And now, although still a pawn down, black is, guess what, again, better. Overall, adding more pieces means more complicated situation for black to start an assault on the white's queen side. In many cases, we need to exchange at least one pair of knights, as we could see here, and often the queen and the light square bishop are blocking the semi-open files, mainly the A file. Therefore, simplifying the position may be actually a good idea for black. Now let's see how all that looks from white's perspective and what they'd like to accomplish. Now we can see that white is using the knights, especially one on b5, to block the attack of black's heavy pieces on the open A and B files, which are the main assets of black. So white is shutting down that. They also moved their pawns away from the starting position. B2 pawn is moved so that the G7 bishop is not attacking it, while the rook from A1 is moved to B1 so that there are no tricks left on that diagonal. White needs to consume a lot of time on the other side to create this fortress. And if black is careful, this would have been very difficult to accomplish. If you have a question, suggestion, or anything related with the Banco Gambit, feel free to put it in the comments. Meanwhile, I'm going to be preparing our next Banco Gambit video, most likely a game example to illustrate how the ideas mentioned today work in practice. Like, subscribe, and see you soon.